Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Duke Pesson. <clears throat> All right, how's everybody today? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good, I'm gonna put aside the microphone if that's okay and just talk to you this way. Well, thank you for letting me be here again. It's a great pleasure to be back in this part of the country. Uh, it's a good deal warmer here than in Wisconsin and all that rain would be a lot of snow if I were back home, so it's nice to be here. Um, I always like to begin these talks by giving you a quick overview of me and how I got involved and then asking you a couple of questions as we begin. And so I got involved. I've been a university professor for about 22 years now. And I've also taught at the high school level. And for me, it dawned on me about five or six years ago that by the time kids get to me in college, they're pretty far gone. Um, whatever faith you've tried to raise them with has been taken from them. And they really have a very negative, you might even say anti-American view of their country. It's very hard to get them at that level and to be able to work with them at all. Their minds have already been pretty frozen on these things. I don't know if you saw the recent survey that came out. It was one of the most comprehensive surveys that's been done in a while. But when your kids graduate from college, they vote the way their professors do about nine out of 10 times. And so that's pretty shocking statistic, right? That uh, the, the, the amount of indoctrination that goes on. If you remember back in the 60s, when kids first be college students first began rebelling, they were rebelling against their professors if you recall that. They were burning books and chanting and occupying buildings. Here we are 50 years later, and now your kids are completely conforming um, to what your professors are telling them. So it dawned on me that I had to get involved at a little lower grade levels if we were going to have a chance to sort of pull some of those kids back. And I uh, became the academic director, besides teaching at the university, I became the academic director of a program called Freedom Project, which is a online, fully online homeschool service for moms and dads. We beam real teachers through the computer into people's living rooms to help with courses that are difficult for homeschool moms and dads to teach. And in doing that, I came across t uh, Common Core. That's where we bumped into it. And 10 months ago, I did not know what Common Core was. Had no idea. Here we are 10 months later. I've sp this is the uh, 139th talk I've given on Common Core in 10 months, 82 of which were in the state of Wisconsin alone. I've been to 26 different states, testified before 14 different state legislatures, uh, with regard to the Common Core in the private and Catholic schools. I have uh, talked to over 27 bishops and over 100 priests about Common Core. And so that's how I got involved. Um, Common Core is a great big problem, and uh, it has so many angles to it, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And so what I'd like to do to begin is to ask you, how many of you as you sit here today would say that your knowledge of Common Core is still a little fuzzy at best? Okay, please look around. That's 90-something percent of you. Common Core has been in your schools for almost two years. It's been around for going on four now in various permutations. It is already transforming the way your kids are being taught, not just in the public schools, but in the private schools as well. Over 100 Catholic dioceses rushed to take Common Core right alongside with the public schools. Protestant schools all across the board, up and down, have taken it. Even many homeschool curriculum has transformed itself to be Common Core compliant. How in the world did this happen? And here you sit, and the fact that you're out on a, uh, a, a rainy Saturday night to come and listen to a talk like this, that suggests to me that you are more politically conscious or educationally aware than the vast majority of American moms and dads. Uh, in a recent survey, it was something like less than 15% of American moms and dads actually knew that Common Core had anything to do with education. How did we get this far along? How did we end up in a situation where the curriculum that is completely transforming our schools, nobody knew about it? The thing we need to remember about Common Core is it's never been voted on by anybody. Pennsylvania didn't ask for it. Ohio didn't ask for it. Wisconsin didn't ask for it. New Jersey didn't ask for it. No state in the union, no governors had a say in this. No teachers unions, no school boards, no moms and dads. The Congress of the United States was not consulted. This was done behind closed doors by small crony capitalist organizations and by the federal government and put in your schools in a way that makes it almost impossible to pull out. And now you're just going to learn about it. We have a big, big problem here. So given that that's where we're all starting from, a perspective where we're not quite sure what Common Core is. <clears throat> Common Core is an abbreviated term. Simply refers to the Common Core State Standards Initiative a set of national standards for English and mathematics. Those are the only two that have been fully implemented so far. 
with science forthcoming and others as well. I want to stop right there. They call them the common core state standards. And that leads you to believe, doesn't it, that all 50 states had some say in this. Didn't happen. One of the things that's so frustrating about dealing with this particular curriculum, these set of standards, is the dishonesty about it all, the mythology that surrounds it. Simply by calling it common core state standards, everybody argues it's a state-led initiative. The states were not consulted, not until way, way, way after everything had been finalized and everything had been validated. The idea that the states somehow got together and did this is just not true. And you will find no evidence that they did. The other thing I like to tell people when I begin this talk, because I think it's really, really important. At the end of my talk, I'm going to put a website up here. It's a free website. No one's going to data mine you or track you. It doesn't cost you anything. I'm going to ask you to go there. If you go to that website, you can get all the slides I'm going to show you today and all the video clips. After you listen to this today, I really hope you will go home and verify me. You will check this out. You will look for yourself. Do not take my word for any of this. You don't know me from Adam. But when you do, in all those talks, all 136 talks, I have yet to receive anybody meaningfully write back to me and say, you know what, you're not telling the truth. So I urge you, you have to please consider doing it. Find out for yourself. Don't take my word for it. And when you do, and if you find out I'm telling you the truth, then I urge you to be every bit as skeptical when you start hearing from your superintendents and from your politicians that this is a great thing. You demand the same proof from them. They will not be able to provide it for you. Here's another piece of evidence that convinces me I'm right about this. You can go and hear Common Core talks in a lot of places. There are a lot of anti-Common Core talks, a lot of groups doing reasons, giving talks on why Common Core is bad. Can you find any pro-Common Core talks in your area? It's interesting, right? We've begged them to come and debate us. We've begged them to come and talk to us. We'll sit down and shut up and listen. They won't do it. The people who support Common Core will not talk to you about it. They will not hold hearings. They, are, they will not come to meetings like this. They will not give you an adequate response to the criticisms that thousands and thousands of people have begun to level at them. If it is what they say it is, why can't they tell you? Why can't they show you? That's damning in my eyes, too. And one of the things you're going to see here is the fuzziness of all of this. They call them the Common Core State Standards, although the states had nothing to do with them, as I'll show you in a moment. One of the things you're going to hear today is a lot of comparisons, not for political reasons, but because we have no other way to compare this. A lot of comparisons between this and the Affordable Care Act. Because this is a huge federalizing of a big part of the economy, a big part of our country, just like the health care law was. And I believe that the federal government learned a lot from the way they handled Obamacare. <clears throat> also, this is very relevant because there are places, and I'll show them to you, there are places in Obamacare that mandate in the name of health your schools to become data mining gathering places on your kids. So we'll show you all that. So the parallels are here. I bring it up now only because you all remember back in 1996 when we had Hillary Care, right? And everybody laughed about that, and Saturday Night Live did skits. Well, they just rolled it out again 12 years later, and they gave it a name like the Affordable Care Act. Because if you're against it, you're against affordability, right? If you're against the Affordable Care Act, you want people to die in the streets? We hear the same thing about Common Core now. If you're against Common Core, well, then you just don't want standards for your kids. Right? It's this simplistic, all-or-nothing way that we approach these issues, right? As if the idea somehow that if we don't adopt these standards, there are no standards. Because that's what we keep hearing from the people who promote this. One of the most frustrating things about that is, is that by definition, education is standards. We've always had them. Uh, and for the most, most of American history, the standards with which we held our kids, to which we held our kids, were much higher than the standards we have now. We asked more of them. We all know, right? We get this, that uh, your kids today when they graduate high school, or your, your kids today when they graduate college, I should say, are learning about what an average high school education would have known, person would have known in the 50s. And you look at all the metrics that demonstrate this. I don't, you ever watched the Jimmy Fallons and the Jay Leno's do these on-campus interviews? There was a staggering one just the other day done at George Washington University, a $60,000 a year college, right, where they asked a bunch, over and over they asked students on campus to name one senator. Not one student of all the students they asked could name a single United States senator, right? And so the idea somehow that if we don't have these standards, because that's how they're pushing it, if we don't have these standards, there'd be standards less. They call it the Common Core State Standards Initiative. How do we get them? Oh, and, and about naming. This is going to be big throughout the course of my talk. Do you know the science standards are already written? 
and they've already begun to implement them in your schools. But they changed the name. Common Core is branding so badly all across the country that they're just changing the name of all the new standards. So the new science standards that are in the process of being implemented are called next generation science standards. Okay? They are 100% Common Core. They just changed the name. They're pretty shocking too. When you'll see them. Uh, I'm not talking about them much today, but they're out there. That's the next thing we're going to have to work on, exposing those. But right now, all we have is math and English with science guidelines forthcoming. Now, here's how we got them. Two small Washington lobbyist groups are responsible for them. But it's even more than that. Five people in these two lobbyist groups. The National Governors Association and the CCSSO, the Council of Chief State School Officers. What these groups are, are basically networking organizations political activist organizations. When you think, hear the National Governors Association, it's tempting to think that there were, somehow we got 50 American governors, state governors in a room. They all rolled up their sleeves and worked on education. That'd be better than what we've got. But I would ask you, what would qualify your governors to write education? What necessarily would qualify them? The NGA isn't even that. The NGA is basically a social club where people go and aides and politicians go to lobby governors to move states in certain direction. Both the NGA and the CCSSO tend to push in a leftward direction. I should also remind you as we begin this here today too, the last of my disclaimers, is that this is not an anti-teacher talk. It's not an anti-principal talk. It's not an anti-education talk. As you'll see in a moment, nobody asked for this. Nobody requested it. Right? Uh, and yet, while it's true that some teachers, oftentimes with, with the figurative gun to their head, say they like it, and there are a lot of other teachers who grumble privately behind closed doors that they don't like it. The fact is, is that they didn't ask for it. They have to deal with it. Uh, also, the last thing I will say, too, about this is that this is a bipartisan problem. This is not a Democrat problem, not a Republican problem. In my state of Wisconsin, we have a Republican governor, a Republican Senate, and a Republican Congress. And we still have Common Core, after all the pushing. In your state, and particularly the state that I've been in most of the week, New Jersey, it's much more a Democrat problem because Democrats control more. You'll see by the time we're done here that this is a much bigger problem than Democrat or Republican for reasons that I will try to show you. So here, with the standards, we have English and math. They've already changed the name of science, right? Next generation science. So these two, these two lobbyist groups, they're basically five men. If you are going to take some notes, and I see some of you are, let me give you a name. I want to give you the name David Coleman. That's where you start. There's a great arg article by Joy Pullman at the Heartland Institute about the five people who wrote Common Core, meticulously researched. Joy Pullman at the Heartland Institute. David Coleman is the chief person responsible for the Common Core. And no sooner did David Coleman finish his work with Common Core than he left the Common Core and he went to work at the college boards where he, in, he is in the process right now of making the SATs completely Common Core compliant and getting paid to do that now too and we'll reap the windfall from all those new tests. By the way, did you know the GED exams have already gone Common Core? Did you know that? In Wisconsin, we have the act. This is actually happening in Wisconsin. We've got moms and dads, older people, who've been studying to get their GED, their high, high school equivalency, for two and three years now. They sat down to take the test this year, and they were given the brand new Common Core GED because none of them had been trained in Common Core. They couldn't take the test. And the state of Wisconsin told them, well, you're too bad. You're going to have to go back and start over. Mm -hmm. This is what's going on. Why such rapid transformation? Why are they rushing this into schools this way? Why the secrecy? Why the refusal to talk about it? Why is it only coming out now what we have here? Again, if this curriculum is so well, these standards and the curriculum that grew up around it, they're so wonderful. Why all the secrecy? Why all the haste? Why all the rush? Right, why the, you've got the SATs being transformed right now when kids are only now just learning this ridiculous Common Core methodology. How, in, in a year when the new SATs are all out, how are your kids who are in high school now or in middle school now, how are they going to pass that? They don't seem to be terribly worried about this or bothered by it. There are things that I know moms and dads are very concerned about. So these five people received a grant of up to a, grants of up to $150 million originally from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So basically five individuals in these two lobbyist groups were funded to the tune of $150 million by Bill and Melinda Gates. In an article released, just a newspaper article released just last week, we now know that Bill Gates confessed to having spent to date $2.5 billion on Common Core. 
promoting it, implementing it, buying off groups publicly, national groups, to advertise for it, to get on board with it. Two point, the only thing Bill Gates has spent more money on than Common Core is abortion and population control in Africa. Those are the only things his foundation has spent more money on. So ask yourself a question, all right? And these facts, I, they're pretty undisputable. I mean, so you can find anything, evidence to the contrary, let me know. But this is the way it happened. A small group of lobbyists were paid a lot of money by Bill and Melinda Gates to write curriculum standards behind closed doors. What in the world qualifies any of those people to have imposed this curriculum on your kids? <clears throat> you know the thing about this that's so frustrating? And here's the copyright, by the way. They own it, these two lobbyist groups. The NGA Center, CCSSO, shall be acknowledged as the sole owners and developers of Common Core State Standards, and no claims to the contrary shall be made. How in the world did a curriculum bought and paid for by a billionaire philanthropist and written behind closed doors by five unaccountable people, how in the world is that your curriculum now, the standards? How are they your standards now? What authorizes them to do so? And the thing that's really frustrating about this is they are utterly unaccountable to you and to me. Who can touch them? Department of Education has no hold over them. You can't vote them out of office. So the curriculum that is beginning to dominate our schools, both public and private, is owned by this entity, bought and paid for by Bill Gates. But it gets worse than that. How are, that's bad enough. But how in the world did this then become your public school curriculum? Well, this is where the federal part comes in. How many of you remember Race to the Top? Remember Race to the Top back in 2009? President Obama, Arne Duncan, the Department of Education, they created this program called Race to the Top. And what was it? It was a program where the federal government basically just gave millions of dollars to the states for education budgets. In fact, Obama at the time called it a stimulus for education. Remember, he was bailing out banks, he was bailing out car companies. Well, he decided to bail out the struggling education budgets of most states. Through the Race to the Top application initially, the initial round of Race to the Top money, the federal government handed out five, over $5 billion of American taxpayer money to the states with this one requirement. If you took the money back in 2009, 2010, you had to accept Common Core standards when they were finally written. They weren't even written yet. Give you an example, the state of New York, back in 2009 and 10, received $700 million from the federal government. With the sole proviso being that whenever we get around to writing the standards, New York State has to take them. That's how 46 states in the Union got Common Core, sight unseen, including Pennsylvania, including New York, including New Jersey, including Wisconsin. That's how 46 states in the Union got Common Core. They'll tell you it's not a federal curriculum, and they'll point to this. They'll say, there's your, there's your copyright. We didn't do it. But look at how it was implemented. Look at what the federal government did to require states to adopt it. And the thing that's most surprising about it is, is that every state that took it, took it before they'd even seen what it was. Where's your state input? They call it the Common Core State Standards. Where's your state input? If the states were, had already taken the standards before they had even been written and revealed publicly, if that happened, then where's your state input? This is pretty shocking. And the other thing that makes it a genuine national curriculum so far is the testing. Because the two big, it wouldn't be standards. This is standards-based education, right? It wouldn't be a standard if it wasn't tested. And all the test results go right back to Washington, DC. They collect the, the Department of Education. They collect all the data. They measure. They monitor. So you see the danger we're in here now. Say what you will about the Affordable Care Act. Say what you will about Obamacare. But at least it had a hearing in the Senate. At least it had a hearing in, a, in the Congress. It was voted on. At least it went to the Supreme Court and had a say. None of this has ever been vetted by anybody. I would argue this is a bigger deal than Obamacare. This is the kids. Remember what Abraham Lincoln said famously, right? The philosophy of the schoolhouse in one generation is the philosophy of government in the next. It just takes one generation to change everything. This kind of control. And, and let me finish telling you the story here. Go back. Oh, go back to here. How many of you remember No Child Left Behind? OK, good. And bipartisan, right? Remind me who the president was when we got No Child Left Behind. George W. Bush, right? Back in 2002, George W. Bush uh, decide, looked around and saw the sorry state of American education relative to high-achieving nations and decided he wanted to do something. 
Who, rem who can, re y'all remember No Child, y'all remember No George Bush. Who remembers who it was that George Bush let write the education curriculum, No Child Left Behind? Who wrote that? Who'd he turn it over to? Bill Bennett. Uh, Bill Bennett. Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy. <laughs> can you tell me the last time, by the way, I I'm just curious, can you tell me the last time a uh, liberal president ever turned over anything like the education bill to a, a conservative senator? Teddy Kennedy and his people wrote every bit of No Child Left Behind, right? And you're right, George W. Bush does deserve the blame for it. But no I bring up No Child Left Behind because it was a disaster. I have never yet met a, a professor, a principal, a high school teacher, middle school teacher, a superintendent of schools. I've never met anybody who deals with elementary or middle or high school education who has anything but contempt for No Child Left Behind. They despise it. And justly so. What do they hate about No Child Left Behind? They hate the, the, the fact that No Child Left Behind continued what had been going on in this country for about 30 years prior, outcome-based education, standards-based education. Let's talk about that for a minute, outcome-based education. It's the idea that it's less important where your kids are when you meet them in class. It's only important that they all get to a certain place at the end. There's a word for that. It's called socialism, right? I mean, if the premise of education is to force kids into the same hole at the end of the road and not worry about how you, with this kind of stuff, it doesn't matter whether you're, what your kids' attitudes are, whether they have good attitudes or bad attitudes. It doesn't matter what the home climate's like, whether it's conducive to learning or not conducive. It doesn't matter if your kids are particularly smart in certain subjects or not. All that matters is, at the end, every kid has to be at the same place. And you know as well as I do, if you're going to have to set a national standard like that, do you inevitably end up hiring or lowering that standard? You have to lower it, right? How many of you have got kids or grandkids? Let me ask you a question. Is it possible for you to get your two daughters and your son to get the exact same grades in every single subject area? No. You can't do it, can you? Inevitably, if, you're, if you're, your, your son is a math and science geek, then your daughter's, gonna, your daughter's gonna be a writing history person. That doesn't mean to say that it's an all or nothing game, that your kids are either passing or failing. But there's no way you can get the kids in your family to excel in the same way in every, the only way you could Get your kids to get exactly the same marks in every class is to lower the overall expectations, right? And that's what happened over 12 years of No Child Left Behind. How many of you remember what happened in places like Atlanta, Georgia, and North Carolina, and New York City? How many of you remember over the last four or five years, superintendents, principals, and teachers taking the kids' tests and dumping them in the trash and forging new exams? Because this is, besides being outcome-based education, this is also high-stakes education, isn't it? In the sense, we, and this is where a lot of conservative, so-called Republicans get suckered in. We want accountability, right? We want accountability. As a 25-year teacher, I can tell you, a lot of us do it well and a lot of us don't do it well. Teachers should be accountable like anybody else. I get that. But this is a tough way to hold teachers accountable. Because how, if you can't get your three kids to the same place, how is a teacher going to get 32 kids in her classroom to the same place? And if she doesn't, then she might not get tenure or she might lose her job. Or the principal whose schools can't get the kids all to those same levels, they're going to be replaced with teachers, who, with principals who will promise to do so. It's a bad system. And so you see, you understand why so many scandals with cheating, because the tests are everything. And by the way, let's talk about the testers. When you have outcome-based education, standards-based education, what's the only way you can ever tell if kids get to the standard? Testing. Endless testing. You remember when we were kids? We're all in a rough age variable here. You remember when we were kids? I remember being a kid. I, we would take the Iowa basic tests two days every March, and that would be the end of it. These kids are testing three, four, five weeks at a time incessantly. This idea somehow, and, and what exactly does being able to, you, you know from your own kids, right? If the only way you could ever measure whether your kids learned anything were rote tests, how would your kids do? It doesn't make any sense. And yet for 40 years now, we have insisted that this one-size-fits-all testing is the only way to determine where our kids' achievement is. To say nothing of the fact that you can't, it, it, the, are any teachers in the room here today, by the way? You know, right, ladies and gentlemen, teachers? that sometimes you have to throw the playbook out, don't you? Sometimes you have a class or a group of kids in a class who aren't responding to the curriculum, the pedagogy that's handed to you. Sometimes you have to scrap it and start over. The best teachers are the ones who know how to meet kids where they are. Things like No Child Left Behind absolutely destroy that because it's all paradigm based and it's all standards based. So everything that gets taught has to be tested. And you know what I know, right? 
that if testing is the only way we measure whether the kids get to the standard or not, then what must your teachers inevitably teach to? The tests, right? And that's not education either, is it? If all you are doing is, is intensively trying to prepare kids for tests that you know are coming, you're not teaching them anything. That's, those are all the reasons why no child left behind was an absolute disaster. So what is Common Core then? I submit to you that Common Core is nothing more than no child left behind on steroids. It is the worst aspects of Common Core, or of no child. Everything I just told you is ratcheted up in Common Core. The tests become more restrictive and more intensive. The outcome-based education goals become absolutely more rigid and inflexible. Do you know, by the way, too, that there is not a single shred of scientific data, not one, that suggests that a state simply having high standards has any impact on student achievement whatsoever? Did you know that? We've been doing this for almost 50 years now, and nobody has ever produced a single study that shows that a state simply adopting high standards has the slightest impact on what goes on in the classroom. It has none whatsoever. So what's the purpose of it then? A study from the Cato Institute that came out just two days ago, I mentioned it because I was kind of startled by it myself. A 40-year comprehensive Cato Institute study demonstrates that all the money spent on education has not moved the needle one inch in terms of what your kids know. In the 40 years since that study was began, Every 40 years they've measured this. And how exponentially higher we've been spending each of those 40 years. Our kids are not one whit appreciably better than they were 40 years ago. The money has nothing to do with it either. But I would argue, this is an these kinds of curriculums, they're not educational curriculums anyway. They're money curriculums. They're, they're about money and control. So that's why No Child Left Behind failed. And by the way, who killed off No Child Left Behind? It wasn't the federal government. Who killed off No Child Left Behind? No Child Left Behind made a mistake. Teddy Kennedy's educational paradigm, it left too much state and local control. There was too much flexibility for states and local, and even individual schools and teachers to vary. And so what happened in No Child Left Behind is working teachers and working classrooms and working moms and dads recognized really early that it was a disaster and it wasn't going to work. What ultimately choked No Child Left Behind to death was the groundswell from the ground up. Well, Common Core is going to fix that. If Common Core ever gets fully implemented, you will not be able to check it at the ground level anymore, as I'm going to talk about in a few minutes here. But I bring up all this stuff about No Child Left Behind because I want you to recognize a couple of things. Number one, even if you kill Common Core tomorrow, the problem is going to stay because all this stuff is already in your schools. Common Core represents a decided step forward, but it's not going to stop. Getting rid of Common Core is important precisely because, and we know this from our history, right? Can you name for me an example of something that's ever gone fully federal, that's ever been given back to the people? Do we have any example of that whatsoever? Whenever the government nationalizes something, does it ever get freed up again? And once this does go fully federal, if that's where it's going, then you're never going to get it back. That's why you have to kill this. But all the problems, this, I, this ridiculous standards-based education, this meaningless and endless repetitive testing, the, the one-size-fits-all education, that's been with us for 40 years. And I mentioned Hillary Care. Again, not because I'm concerned about the politics of it, but my point is, is do you see how they never stop? The people who want bigger, bigger government, the people who want to cede more control to the federal government, they never stop. And if you kill Common Core now, I promise you in five years they're going to roll it out again. And they're going to call it something like happy, happy, joy, joy education. Because <laughs> you're not against joy and happiness, are you? That's what they do. And they've done it, and you know how I know it? They've done it for 40 years in education. They keep rolling it out with names like uh, no child left behind. So if you oppose that, that means you must want kids left behind, right? The ridiculousness of this. But this is where we sit. And here's the final piece of the puzzle. This, I think, is really cynical. When the federal government created Race to the Top and, and gave all those states billions of dollars and said, the only thing you have to do to ta if you take the money is adopt Common Core when we get around to writing it. They, offered one, they dangled one other carrot in front of all those states. Oh, and by the way, if you take the money, we'll give you a waiver from No Child Left Behind. Can't make that up. So the federal government basically bribed the states to take the curriculum that hadn't been written 
and also told them you can stop teaching No Child Left Behind. What gets me is how did four states not do it? How did only 46 jump on that bandwagon? But there were four states that didn't. Nebraska, Alaska, Virginia, and Texas, all four of them said no. Pretty shocking. So not only do you bribe states to get out of No Child Left Behind, you immediately force them to take something that is exponentially worse than No Child Left Behind. If all those things that I just mentioned about No Child bother you, well, that's what Common Core is in a much more significant way. That's how we got here. Right? There's three parts to this talk today. Part one is this part. How in the world did we get here? Part two is let's look at the standards that we've got so far, English and math, let's look at them. And part three is, as always happens with big federal programs, you don't just get the program. You get these tentacles that reach into all. We see it with the Health Care Act, right? It's why Mayor uh, Bloomberg is trying to ban 32-ounce sodas in the name of health. It's why they're coming after guns now. They couldn't get rid of guns through a variety of other areas, but now under the guns are a health care issue, aren't they? Right? Now we have a reason to try to ban them. Any of you have little kids you've taken to the doctors lately? You get those little forms that the doctors make your kids fill out? They're asking your kids about the guns, aren't they? You take your kid to the, to the pediatrician, you take your eight-year-old boy to get a physical because he wants to play CYO basketball, and the doctor is asking him, he's giving a, a list of questions the boy has to fill out, like, are there guns in your house, and would you feel safer, healthier, if somebody took those guns out of your house? You see that whenever you get a big program like this, it doesn't just limit itself to what it does. It, it has tentacles, and that's the third thing we're going to look at. But I'm not quite done with this yet. This is Banana Republic stuff. The people who own and implemented this curriculum and the standards, they're not accountable to you. Let me ask you this. I always like to play this game. How would you feel? And how do you think the people who most support Common Core right now would feel? How would you feel if instead of Bill and Melinda Gates, it was the evil Koch brothers who put up $2.5 billion? And instead of two left-leaning Washington lobbyist groups, you had two right-leaning ones. And what if instead of a very liberal president, you had a very conservative one? who basically took your money to bribe all the states to take a curriculum they hadn't seen and give them a waiver from the last ridiculous federal program. I don't know about you, I'd be just as upset about this. But I bet those people who now support it would be against it. And you know, in, this is the interesting thing. In the 11 or 12 months that we've really had a chance to look at the standards, People are starting to fight back on both sides of the aisle. Of the 46 states that took it, 24 already have in place legislation to try to kill all or part of Common Core after just 11 months. In New York two weeks ago, the New York State Teachers Union, let me repeat that again. The New York State Teachers Union, hardly some right-wing tinfoil hat wearer organization, the New York State Teachers Union called for the immediate halt to the implementation of Common Core and demanded the firing of the superintendent of schools who brought it in. The National Education Association, the single largest teacher union group in the country and most liberal, has called the implementation of Common Core so utterly and completely botched that they have to be scrapped and start over. These are not left, these are not just right wing problems. Um, I told you the bipartisan, you know who else is really, really opposed to Common Core? Is the Occupy Wall Street movement. Because the people who are going, look at David Coleman, right? He got huge money from Gates to write it, then he immediately went to the college boards where he's changing the complete college entrance paradigm to meet his and getting paid to do that too. Whose computers, by the way? Every, in order to do Common Core testing in your schools, Every kid must have his own computer, and they must be all within two or three years old, and the whole country has to be wired, because you can't leave rural schools out. There are thousands of rural school districts who do not have adequate computer power and, and uh, uh, processing ability, speed. All of them will have to be updated now. Whose computers do you think are going in those schools? You think they're Apple computers? <laughs> and Occupy Wall Street's point is, is that this is the worst kind of crony, and they're right about that. This is the worst kind of crony capitalism. This is an ugly marriage between an out-of-control federal government and an out-of-control small group of capitalist entrepreneurs who are going to reap huge windfalls from this. I haven't even mentioned the textbook companies yet. Oh, we'll get to them. All right. So think about how we got here today. How do we as Americans, how do we as, are we really a free people if this can happen? And, and now, you see what's happened across the country now. Now that moms and dads are starting to get annoyed with this, now that people are beginning to see the real applications of this in the classroom, people are speaking out. And what is the attitude to your school superintendents? What is the attitude of your politicians about this when you speak out? Remember what Arne Duncan said? 
uh, the, sec the Secretary of Education, the, the chief educational officer in the country. Remember what he said a couple months ago? Uh, it's just a bunch of privileged suburban white moms who are upset because their kids aren't as smart as they thought they were. Right? That's Arne Duncan. The oh, and by the way, here's a question for you. Arne Duncan, the chief educational officer in the country, he's not a teacher. He's not an educator. What was his degree in? Anybody know? Sociology. Right. Why would the president appoint a sociologist as the chief educator? And why did no Republican seek to block that, do you think? Right? So you've got somebody in the Department of Education now who's clearly playing sociological games here. It's not about education. Go a little bit forward. What happens if? If the federal government does fully come to control education, Pennsylvania is another state, like New Jersey is another state, like Wisconsin. I've taught and li lived and worked and taught in seven states. I have never, ever paid the kind of real estate property taxes I pay in Wisconsin. They're huge through the roof. And I know you got it bad here, and it's really bad in places like New York and New Jersey. But I suppose if there is some redeeming grace about paying all that tax, in theory anyway, some of it goes back to the schools. Most of it's supposed to go to the schools. If this ever gets fully federalized and you're paying all those taxes, is that money going to be able to stay in Pennsylvania? No. It's going to have to go to Washington, isn't it? Yep. To be redistributed. Mm -hmm. And you know as well as I do, right, that as bad as Pennsylvania schools are, they're still much better than schools in places like Oklahoma or Louisiana or Mississippi. So where's all your money going to go? It's going to have to go to those other states, right? Mm -hmm. To say nothing of the fact that despite all the money spent on this by people like Bill Gates, the $2.5 billion he invested is nothing compared to how you're going to have to upgrade your schools, how you're going to have to put the entire infrastructure in for this. Your schools have already spent hundreds of millions of dollars to throw out all the old textbooks and to bring in the new Common Core textbooks. This is a complete and total, in fact, before you even knew Common Core was in your schools, your schools had jettisoned the previous textbooks in favor of Common Core textbooks. Right? Now do you see what they've done to you? If this is indeed as bad as I say it is, or as bad as many of you already see that it is, if it is, do you see the extra legal me measures you're going to have to go through to get rid of it? You've got to now, f that, I think that's one of the main reasons why they won't talk to you about it. Because they don't have to. There's no real way to defend this. And even when you do get somebody, go to a school board meeting and try to consult them about this. Ask them about what I'm telling you now. Doesn't that bother you? Well, well we, let's, we, let's talk about the standards. Okay, yeah, right, let's ignore this. But I think that's the real reason they won't talk to you. Is because this is not really defensible. The way they did it, how they did it, and what they did, it's not really defensible. So, but it's the law. So, you notice how, when was the last time your president spoke, spent a lot of time talking about the Affordable Care Act, or any of his cronies up there? They don't spend much time talking about it now, do they? All those people who told us how wonderful it was going to be, they kind of just, they, they're trying desperately not to make it a campaign issue. Because you see it now, right? But the good news is they don't have to talk about it because it's the law. They're going to, they hope they can just wait you out. Same thing with this. Just wait it out. It, it's in the schools and every day that goes by and every month that goes by, it gets more in your schools as you're just now learning about it. Now you're already starting to get from your politicians, right? I get it from my politicians in Wisconsin. Well, we've spent so much money on it, we can't just pull it out now, right? Now, isn't that convenient, right? The federal control, oh, federal control of education, it's dangerous. Right now, if there's a bad lesson in your, in, your t in your schools or a bad book or a sexuality lesson, sex ed lesson, that you don't want your kids to have to sit through, you know, you can go up to your school, talk to your teacher, and opt your kid out. It's that simple. That's what I mean by no child left behind, leaving way too much state and local control. It. You can go to your principal and say, I don't want my daughter reading that book. Send her to the library to do homework that day. I'll, I'll substitute it. And they, they'll, they'll do it for you. If this ever gets fully federalized at the federal level, and it's all standards-based tested, are you going to be able to opt your kids out of stuff again? You're not going to be able to, are you? As a matter of fact, if you want to opt your kids out, you're going to have to call Washington. 1-800-ARNIE-DUNCAN. How long do you think you're going to be waiting online before Arnie picks up the phone? <laughs> it's a sad reality, isn't it? I mean, what then, and once it gets fully federalized, what role do state and local school boards play anymore anyway? They can't do anything different. You're already seeing this now. One of the reasons why all those teachers who really hate it won't tell you is because they are under absolute threats from their principals and superintendents to get on board or go home. 
right? Another big article in the news today about a teacher. A teacher went and testified, but she's been threatened 16 different times to keep your mouth shut about it. You either, you either like it or you be quiet about it. It's a big time problem we've got here, right? In terms of this federal control stuff. You're not going to have the, what, there's the, the, here's the parallel example, and you'll see it in a moment. Under Obamacare, all the states now are supposed to set up these exchanges, right? Does the state of Ohio really have the power to offer you something that's not Obamacare? Or does the state of Ohio just administer the federal program? Wisconsin, Nevada, all they do, all the states do now, the states aren't independent healthcare agents. <clears throat> all the states do is they are recruited now to implement a federal program. Wouldn't it have to be by definition the same if this gets federal, fully federalized at the, at, uh, as an educational program? What do the states do? What does your state and local school board do now? It has no power. It's just a cipher. All it does is enforce the federal regulations. Do you see what a huge breakdown of state power this is? Seeding yet uh, nothing, nothing since health care has been ceded so big to the federal government if they get their way. And what does that say about your ability to impact your kids' education in the school districts where you live? You'll have no say. And how do you get a hold of these people in Washington to listen to you? You can't. And last part of my opening here, it's not even just liberal teachers unions and the Occupy Wall Street movement and the NEA and the, the American Federation of Teachers all condemning it, not just that. All the other myriad conservative groups too condemning it, right? We don't have to enumerate them. But then you get this, the Department of Education's two chief lawyers, the two chief lawyers for the Department of Education, way back in 2008 and 2009, they called this unworkable and a violation of three federal statutes, that the, the Department of Education has no business doing that. In imposing the Common Core Standards and the aligned assessments, because that's what makes it federal, right? The fact that how we got it makes it federal with the Race to the Top program and the test. In imposing the Common Core Standards and aligned assessments on the states, the federal government is violating three statutes and has put America on the road to a national curriculum with respect to the Race to the Top Common Core Scheme. Robert S. Eitel and Kent D. Talbert, former Deputy General Counsel and General Counsel, respectively, of the U.S. Department of Education, concluded that, quote, these standards and the tests will ultimately direct the course of elementary and secondary study in the 46 states, most states that took it, running the risk, now this is where the Obamacare thing comes in, running the risk that states become little more than administrative agents for a national K-12 program and raising a fundamental question about whether the department is exceeding its statutory boundaries. These, this is the Department of Educator, Education's two top lawyers telling you this. On the, and you know, right, we're smart enough, savvy enough to realize you don't get to be the chief lawyer in the Department of Education if you are not sympathetic to the aims of education. In other words, there aren't many non-liberal lawyers at the Department of Education. And they're telling you this. It's a big deal. They go on. The race to the top application. The initial vehicle through which Common Core, that's it, was imposed. The race to the top application. The initial vehicle through which Common Core was imposed on the states. Now, this is the federal government, not Common Core. In the race to the top application that all 46 states took, it is, this is stipulated. It requires that applicants adopt, quote, a set of content standards that are substantially identical across the consortium. Now, I repeat, that is not a Common Core law. That's a federal government law. If you took race to the top money, you must have the same curriculum in all those states. That curriculum is Common Core, which you also got by taking the money. Now, here's an interesting thing. According to the race to the top program, generously, the states can supplement Common Core by 15%. They, the states, may supplement the standards, add to them, but only if the additional standards do not exceed 15% of the state's total. There is no provision to remove any aspect of Common Core. So the, the Common Core you have to take in its entirety, all of it. You can add up to 15% more, but that's a big lie too. Because again, if Ohio and Wisconsin and Texas and Minnesota can all do things 15% differently, do you think the federal government is going to make 50 different tests? Because they would have to, right? How are you going to account for all those different 
One of two things have to happen. Either the federal government has to make 50 different state tests, because all the states are going to do it differently, the 15%, right? Either you have to make 50 different state tests, and if you do that, you don't have a national standard anymore. And the federal government isn't doing that. Or your teachers realize, and, about, and they've realized them already, realize this already, that there's no point teaching anything else because it'll never be on the test. And I, st I hear this from school administrators. It makes me want to vomit. We can add to them. <laughs> you haven't had your first tests in Pennsylvania yet. We haven't had them in Wisconsin yet. New Jersey hasn't had them yet. You know who's had them yet? Four, four states in the union were singled out as early test common core states. Of those four, one pulled out entirely and wanted no part of it. That was Virginia. There are three states that have already gone through two rounds of testing on common core. They've had it for two years longer than you have. New York, Florida, and Kentucky. And it's been a screeching disaster. Why are the, is the New York State's Teachers Union, why are they backing out? Because the first two rounds of Common Core tests in Florida saw an overall drop in math and English standards from the seven, roughly the 79th percentile down to the 39th for two consecutive years. Two consecutive years. Those four states, millions of dollars was spent to advertise, propagandize, push for Common Core in those states before anybody in Pennsylvania even knew there was a Common Core. This is what's going on here now. And people in your state, in my state, in New Jersey are telling us, this is never going to happen. We can, we can supplement the standards. In New York, they've already figured this out. Teachers were actually adding things to Common Core because it wasn't working. They were adding things to try to help kids learn better. And then the two years of tests came, and none of that stuff that they tried to add was on it, only the Common Core. So if you're going to teach to the tests, which is what you have to do with this kind of education, you can't teach anything else. That, that kind of stuff, that dishonest, look at how open we are garbage, that's the kind, and people buy that, right? But you haven't seen your first tests yet. All right, <clears throat> that's the end of part one. That's how we got here. I believe, with every fiber of my being, I've told you the truth, and I urge you to look for yourself. If that's true, even if you think there might be some merit in them, even if you think Common Core might in some way represent a better thing than you have now, how in the world do you justify this? And you do see, right, what a dangerous precedent this is. Again, say what you will about Obamacare. At least it went through. Uh, there's a lot of chicanery around that, too, right? Remember bribing senators, the, the Nebraska kickback, the Louisiana Purchase bribing senators? But at least you have the veneer of trying to go through some sort of legislative process. I remind you as we move on to the second part of the talk, nobody anywhere, anytime, at any point had a, had a vote on this. No, you were never consulted. Your governors were never consulted. Your school boards were never consulted. Your teachers were never consulted. Federal government, the Congress and Senate of the United States was never consulted on any of this. And here it is in your schools. And now you're learning about it. After, it's all a fait accompli now. Again, as we move off this, you can't not think about this. This is huge and important. So let's talk now about the standards themselves. I need a drink. Give me a second here. Well, after 140 times talking about this, let me tell you, you need one more history lesson for part two. And the history lesson is this. After that very small coterie of individuals led by David Coleman wrote the standards, the curriculum standards, they then did something which seems like a good idea. They decided they wanted to put a committee together whose job it was to assess the standards and validate them. It was appropriately named the Validation Committee. So they brought 29 people to Washington, mostly political activists and low-level educator people, teachers, middle school, uh, elementary school teachers. And they brought one English language arts specialist and one math specialist. That was it. They brought one big time math professor. He's, his name is Professor James Milgram. He's a math professor at Stanford University. Milgram is the guy who did most of the mathematics for the Apollo moonshots in the late 60s, right? He did all that math. Big time guy. And the English language arts specialist was Professor Stan Sandra Stotsky one of the foremost English, developmental English specialists in the country. She's retired, did most of her time, did, spent, mo I'm a professor, spent, did most of her time, spent most of her career down in Arkansas, right, where she's now living in Massachusetts. These were the two people, the only, the only one math person and the only one English person that they brought in. Both of them refused to validate the standards. 
Milgram said, it is an ab quote, it is an absolute joke to think that these standards will prepare our kids for college and careers in math. It's an absolute joke. He said, these standards will set our kids two years behind the two years they're already behind the rest of the world in math and technology subjects. Sandy Stotsky said that, th that these, this curriculum was a disaster, that it would in no way, shape, or form prepare kids for the kind of reading and writing they need to do in college and career. No way. They both voted no. Not only did they both vote no, they convinced other people to vote no. Well, the validation committee ignored their comments, wrote them out of the document, and validated the standards anyway. You can find the validation committee report online. It never mentions them once even though they were hired with the idea that if the standards weren't sufficient, they would be allowed to fix them. They weren't allowed to fix them. They were just written out of the committee document. Stotsky and Milgram both have been touring the country now. And, and please keep this in mind, too. They know more about Common Core than anybody in your whole state because they were in the room. When you get to the end of this document, and I put that website up, you can go. We, we brought Stotsky and Milgram to Wisconsin to testify before our state legislature. They each testified for about two hours each. You can watch, absolutely free of charge, their testimony. I beg you to watch it, because they're the experts. They were in the room. It'll blow you away, absolutely blow you away. At one point, you know, the, we, those of us who were fighting Common Core in Wisconsin, we brought people like Milgram and Stotsky in, because you know they're the experts. All the Wisconsin's Department of Education, the DPI it's called, Department of Public Instruction, all the DPI brought in was their own teachers. They literally, we had four hearings in Wisconsin at the state level. They literally took teachers out of the classroom, bussed them to Madison, paid for their salaries, hired substitute teachers to take their classes while they bussed the teachers in. And the teachers just got up and they all read prepared statements about why Common Core was great. And all of them were the same. They all read the same template. They all said the exact same thing in the exact same order. That's all they brought. And at one of our hearings, Milgram was there because we brought him in. And finally, he just he couldn't take it anymore. They, the, the, one, the young lady speaking was a sixth grade math. She was a, she'd been teaching for two years, and she taught sixth grade math. And so Milgram stands up and interrupts her. He says, excuse me. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for teaching math to our sixth graders. It's an absolute noble calling, and I appreciate you for doing it. But do you know the difference between a sixth grade math teacher and a mathematician? A deer in the headlights, right? Do you know the difference between somebody teaches math to sixth graders and somebody who has enough mathematical background to begin to construct a national standard in math? And no, she didn't. As Milgram points out, and you can watch the testimony, there are 22 mathematicians in this country who could do it. There's none in Wisconsin. We'd have to, there's one in Minnesota. We'd have to go to Minnesota. There just aren't that many. The entire case being made for Common Core in Pennsylvania comes from sophomore geometry teachers and eighth grade English teachers. What qualifies them to have any sense of what goes into making standards? Nothing. This is it. These are the only people defending it. And most of those people are defending it because it's in the schools and the principals have told them, get on board or get out. That's it. You know the other thing that Milgram and Stotsky both point out? These standards have never been benchmarked against any high achieving country anywhere. These standards have never been tried before. There's no past track history for them. One of the things that people keep telling you about Common Core, they tell you that lie. Oh, we've benchmarked these. Find any evidence for it. Milgram said, I, as the math guy, I asked them, show me your data. Show me one country that you, read, you measured any of this with, and they provided nothing for them. Not a thing, ever, anytime, anywhere. There's only one aspect of this curriculum that's ever been tried anywhere else, and I'll wait till we get to math to tell you that. All right? And that was a disaster when they tried it. Here's something I want you to look up if you're fact-checking me. Go back to the Washington Post, September of 2013. Bill Gates conducted an interview in which Bill Gates said, and I quote, it would be nice to know if our education stuff works, but it will be at least 10 years before we know. That's a direct quote from the man who bought and paid for it. We have no, he admitted it himself. We have no idea if this is going to work. Your kids are guinea pigs, just like they were guinea pigs with no child left behind. 12 years of no child left behind. A lost generation of kids. And you're being told now everything that those kids were told. Well, we spent billions of dollars on it. We've got to keep it. So, when Sandy Stotsky, the, the English language arts professor, when she finished her testimony, that's the only question she got from any Democrat on the committee. The only thing they asked her was, 
We spent millions on this. You want us to scrap it? And she said, better scrap it now than spend billions on it over the next 10 years. She said, she raised a great point. She said, let me ask you this. What do you think about No Child Left Behind? And the Democrat senator said, it was a disaster. Okay. Would you have been willing to cut your losses after one year? After you had seen it for one year, would you be willing to cut your, oh, absolutely. Well, here's your one year. Right? Get out of it now. And you can watch their testimony online. You can watch it at our site or you can go on. Just, and by the way, Vostotsky and Milgram have been to about 40 states now, begging states not to do this. Just type their names in and watch them. See if they make a reasonable case. Milgram has all the math, by the way. It's way above my head. The, all the mathematics about why this isn't going to work, he's got it. Go watch them. I urge you to do it. This is English. Now, I can speak about English being an English professor, right? Sandy and I have talked about this we brought, when we brought her in. The problem with the English language art standards are manifold. But among other things, Common Core English requires that 50% of the classic literature that your kids usually learn to read by is removed from the curriculum and it's replaced by informational texts, almost all of which is highly politically tendentious executive orders from President Obama. Sandy once estimated that about 80% of the informational texts are all about man-made global warming. There's no balance. There's no sense that there's another way of looking at things. You're, I'll show you some of the exemplar texts in a moment. But just think about what this means. Why do, as an English professor, I know the answer to this, why, when you put your kids to bed, why do you read them stories? If the purpose was to get your kid to go to sleep, shouldn't you read them Microsoft computer manuals? I mean, that would do it, right? But you don't. You read them stories. Why? Because storytelling is how young kids develop into readers. And that, that, when I say young kids, I mean all the way through high school. We, kids learn how to love reading. Kids learn how to engage as readers. Kids' imagination is fired by reading, by reading stories. Common Core removes 50% of that literature and replaces it with environmental protection agency pamphlets. I'll show you them in a few minutes. And the things that they're replacing it with is all highly charged and political, all coming from the left, all of it. There is no balance. There's no even pretense at any kind of political balance. It's not critical thinking. It's indoctrination, as Sandy wrote in the chart, right? What do you get with Common Core? You get much more indoctrination within the text they read and much less discussion of ethics and morality and character. That's what literature used to do. Think about the literature they're pulling out of your classrooms. It's the great literature of the Western tradition. You know, the 2,000-year arc of Judeo-Christian culture, from Augustine to Dante to Milton, right, to C.S. Lewis. All that bound us in the West as a coherent culture, right, with all the evolving things that it gave us. All that's yanked apart now. And think about what they're not getting in American lit. All of that literature that over a couple of hundred years lay out for kids the American ethos, the struggles, the evolution of American culture, all of that's pulled out and fragmented now. And what they're getting to replace it is almost always one-sided political dogmatic doctrinaire left-wing propaganda. Right? And by the way, Sandy's a good Yankee, a good Yankee, she called herself, good Yankee Massachusetts Democrat. She's no right-winger. Right? But she's galled by this. And then... The other thing Common Core English does, we know by every metric ever attempted, we know kids only learn how to write, write well after they can read well. I mean, it's just common sense, right? When you take a foreign language, you don't start writing it. You got to read it first, right? Nobody sits down to take a foreign language and starts writing in French. You have to read some French stories, learn some French vocabulary, learn some French grammar. Common Core lowers the overall level of reading in English by 50% and elevates the level of writing by 50%. They're writing more than they're reading. What do you think kids who can't read well are writing about? I'll give you an example from my own home state of Wisconsin. Little Hudson, Wisconsin had a viral, went national, right? Where little kids in my state were sent home, third graders, and given the following writing assignment. Tell us how the state is just like the family but better. That was their writing assignment. And this, I'm now giving away the game. If you ask me, you put a gun to my head and ask me, what in one word Common Core is, that's it. It's statism. It has nothing to do with education. It is a concerted effort on the part of the government to convince your kids they belong first to the government and second to you. It is a drive that at every sense of the, in every sense of curriculum we're going to look at, it seeks to divorce parents from children, to make kids wards of the state. You know in Wisconsin? And this, this has been going on for a long time. This is not all new to Common Core. How about this 
how school lunch programs have now become school breakfast, lunch, and dinner programs. Who's going to be responsible for feeding your kid? I once made the suggestion, I don't know if I was going to get lynched. I once made the suggestion that if we're going to be feeding the kids three times a day in the public schools, shouldn't we take the food stamps away from their parents? Oh, that didn't go over well. <laughs> no, of course we have to leave the food stamps, right? In Green Bay, I don't know if you know this or not, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, they applied for a grant. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, they are offering bre free breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not just for the whole school year, but all summer long, too. Because if we stop feeding them in the summer, they're going to starve to death. And this is the real kick in the pants with the Green Bay program. The, the Memphis, Tennessee did this too. The argument is, is that if you only give the free meals to kids who need them for income reasons or whatever, if you only give the free meals to kids that need them, you're stigmatizing those kids as poor. So they're giving them to every kid. Your parents could be making a million dollars a year. They got to get a free meal too. Because if you just give them to the kids who need it, those kids are stand out as somehow poor victims. So in Green Bay, Wisconsin, we're offering three meals a day, every day, all year long, to public school kids. Who's feeding your kids now? Right? The state. There's so many ways in which this stuff explodes. Writing. If you're asking kids to write at younger and younger ages, more and more thoroughly, before they know how to read, the only thing you're doing to them is forcing them to write about what you tell them to write. You are encoding and indoctrinating them. You are not allowing the writing process to flow naturally out of what they read. You are, like that assignment I told you about, right? Tell us how the state is just like the family, but better. You're encoding them. Here are some of those exemplar texts. Notice how none of them have anything to do with English, what they're reading about in English class. So freshmen in high school are reading recommended levels of insulation, a report released in 2010 by the EPA and the Department of Energy. So your kids, your freshmen in high school show up all rosy cheeked the first day and they read about how to properly insulate buildings. Is this in any way, shape or form going to make your kids want to read? <laughs> Science, math and tech subjects they're reading about. Ex President Obama's Executive Order 13423, strengthening federal environmental energy and transportation management. The evolution of a grocery bag, a long article. <laughs> Spoiler alert, paper and plastic are both bad and America's destroying the planet. Oh, as Stotsky points out over and over and over again in these exemplar English texts, it's one of two things. It's either radical environmentalism or it's absolutely inappropriate sexuality, which is what we should talk about now. You can just take, oh, before we, b before we move off these exemplars, I love this one. It's the invasive plant inventory for sixth graders. Just a list, just a long list of all those plants that weren't indigenous to this country that somebody brought here and now are choking out other plants. Just a nice long list, right? This is the kind of stuff they're reading. And then what literature is left in? begs another question. Why is so much of the literature that is actually left in Common Core, why is it so developmentally and sexually inappropriate for kids? This is but one of many examples. This is Toni Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. Now, Toni Morrison is a great writer. She's an African-American novelist. She's a uh, Nobel Prize winner. She's fantastic. But we would not assign this book to freshmen in college. It's a book about a 12-year-old girl who's the victim of rape and incest. And she ultimately comes to bond with her rapist and describes in excruciatingly graphic detail their physical encounters. This has been in hundreds of American school districts already, this book, including Catholic schools for kids as young as eighth grade. And I'm going to show you briefly a couple of passages from the book. I've blocked out all the bad words. But if I don't, I've, I've tried to do this talk before and not show them. And people will walk up to me afterwards and say, you're full of crap. So here you go. You can get a sense of them, right? This is the bluest eye. There are dozens of books like this, graphic and, all, and, and developmentally inappropriate in all sorts of ways. Another, another famous one that's all over the internet is Dreaming in Cuban with its graphic sexual descriptions. So you can get a sense of what's there. I mean, it goes on and on. And Stotsky asks the question, and it's a great question. We had, why didn't she vote for it? Well, among other things, we have to explore why so many of these texts are out of place, not just in the subject area Common Core place them, but in a high school curriculum altogether. And I'm going to let that question hang just for a minute. I'll answer it, but I'm going to let it hang. 
Why? What in the world are they making kids read books like that for when there's so much else to read? And even when, this, this will blow you away, even when they do leave actual serious good stuff in an English class, they prohibit them from teaching it a good way. One of the exemplar texts for Common Core English is the Gettysburg Address. Well, that's a good, now it's a history text. I don't know why it's in an English class, but okay. It's the Gettysburg Address. When teachers teach the Gettysburg Address in Common Core pedagogy, they are not allowed to tell the students who wrote the speech. They are not allowed to mention the Civil War. They are not allowed to provide any cultural or background information that would help the kids understand the speech. You just read the speech in a vacuum. And why do they do that? Because all that historical and cultural background is deemed privileged information. Not every kid will have had a chance to know it, so it's unfair to talk about it. So you actually got teachers now, right? In gay, and and the, the, you're going to do common core pedagogy, you've got to do it that way. All, almost all the, the, the literary texts that you read in Common Core, they're vacuum texts. You only look at them, you never, discuss, you never bring in outside ideas or concepts. All right, now let's talk briefly about math. As Milgram said, this will in no way prepare kids for college math. Where, as Milgram put it, where are your architects, your engineers, your doctors going to come from? STEM, you, uh, you all know what STEM is? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That's what people who care about math curriculum and standards care about. Are they STEM worthy? Will, they will American math prepare kids for careers in science, technology, engineering, and math? STEM, will they? Uh, Milgram says absolutely categorically, categorically this curriculum will not. In fact, here's another name for you. Remember I mentioned those five people besides David Coleman? Here's another one you should write down. Jason Zimba, Z-I-M-B-A. He is the man single-handedly responsible for the math standards. And he admitted in a very recent interview, you should double check this too, he admitted in a very recent interview when pushed on this that yes, it's true, common core math will not prepare kids for college math. He said at best, it might, in the best circumstances, prepare them for a two-year technical college, but not for college. That's the guy who wrote the standards, Jason Zimba. Look him up. Right? And so in talking to people like Jim Milgram and talking to people who've done this kind of standards work, the argument, that, trying to find out why, well then what is the purpose of Common Core Math if it's not to get our kids college ready for math? What's the purpose? I was directed by them to this video. It's a short clip. This young woman, she is a community organizer in Chicago. You cannot make that up. Right? <laughs> and she's talking to a group of Illinois high school math teachers about what the philosophy of Common Core Math is. And here's what she says. But even under the new Common Core, if, even if they said 3 times 4 was 11, if they were able to explain their reasoning and explain how they came up with their answer really in um, words and in oral explanations, and they showed it in the picture but they just got the final number wrong, we're really more focusing on the how and the way to we, be correcting them. And over and over again, that's what the people on the committee said that when we tried to get to the bottom of what in the world this was about, that's it. It's not about right answers. The right answer is absolutely subordinate to making people feel comfortable about math. Making them comfortable. Now, a little background history. When I was in third grade, I actually had like a college level, introductory college level reading ability. I, I don't know why I had it, but as a third grader, I could do that. And so in third grade, I was allowed to do read big people books, right? I wasn't stuck reading Beezus and Ramona over and over again. I could read, they let me read books. You are not allowed to have kids going beyond the standard any more than you can have them falling short of it, right? Do you understand that kids who really are capable of doing serious math, they're going to be, they can't do it now. What she said here is right. One of the primary ways that they do common core math at the lower grades particularly is the pair and share program where your teachers don't teach math anymore. Teachers come to class, they put kids in groups of two and three and they give them a problem. And the purpose of the assignment is to get every kid in the group to agree to the same answer. I actually have a number of tests that have been mailed to me by moms in places like New York where, and Kentucky where they've been doing this for two years. One little boy wrote six times seven, a third grader, it's a multiplication question, six times seven, he wrote 42. He got it marked wrong. And there was a note from his teacher in red pencil that the other two children in his pair group agreed on a different answer. 
They got it marked right because they agreed. He got it marked wrong, even though he had the right answer, because he did not agree with the other two people in his group. We have another kid who, in a simple addition question, the answer was 111. He got it marked wrong because he wrote 111. And he got it marked wrong because he didn't draw in the box provided 111 circles. That was the only acceptable way to answer the question, draw 111 circles. This next clip was given to me by the same people, and they pointed this out to me. They said, look, this is exactly what goes on in Common Core Math. And there are thousands, I'm going to show you a short clip of a little girl working in Common Core Math. There are thousands of these clips on the internet. Any of you got kids in Common Core Math right now? One of the staggering things is, is that, can you help your kid with their math homework? Yeah. You can? Yeah, unfortunately I can. How, do, how did you figure out the Common Core way? I don't know. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> Well, I'm going to show you this. This, this, this woman is a, uh, a mom right, with a lot of math background who can't help her kid. I've got a doctor in Green Bay. She took calculus in eighth grade. She, she one of the only women ever, one of the only doctors ever to ace the complete the math section, 100, complete 100% 100 of the math boards for, their, for her, her pre-med. She can't help her fifth grader with math, not because she doesn't know the math, but because of all this weird way they have to do it. This video was given to me by the people on the committee, and they said, look, look at this. This is exactly the problem you have with Common Core Math. So watch this. It's a, a simple addition question. Takes Great. So what I want you to do is, can you solve that problem showing me the way that you learned how to solve it in school? Okay. And talk to me while you're solving it. So we learned that a big square like this it's a hundred. So we could make that hundred into a cube, which would make a thousand. So I'm going to do that. Oh, no. So let's just say that's a thousand. Mm -hmm. And now we ha we still have to do five hundred. Could make that into five sheets. And we have sixty, which are just nine to ten. One. For her birthday, she got a thousand. Twenty-three. Mm -hmm. The dots represent one. Okay. So now we have to add all of these together. So you could make a thousand. All of these together is 400. Now you need 600 more. So now I'm going to write the numbers down. So we have 1,000 plus well, let's just say 3,000, because we have three cubes. 3,000 plus 100, 100, So now we can erase all these sheets and hundreds and tens and tables. Maybe we can mm -hmm. just add, and that gives us a total of 3,763. Okay. Now that problem you just solved took about eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're doing in school. But at home, I'm taught how to stack, and we're not allowed to do stacking in school. That's why we have to figure it out that way. Okay. So I'm going to stack these numbers, which is way easy. What are you thinking? You're looking at your problems. I got 
got two different answers. You got two different answers. What do you think happened? Maybe I counted wrong. Looks like you did the stacking correctly. And that took you about a minute. So I think I did something messed up in, on this sheet. Out of the mouths of babes, right? Out of the mouths of babes. Look, do you understand how this way of doing math, and I gotta tell you, it's, the thing that's so frustrating about Common Core math is it's not always that way. I mean, if in every time a kid had to do Common Core math, a square was 100 and a cube was 1,000, at least you'd have some regularity. But you've got kids all over the country doing it a 1,000 different ways. Sometimes it's squiggly lines and dots and dashes. Sometimes it's, it's, it's unbelievably, incredibly broad and varied. We have another situation from a, from a school in Wisconsin, the Dairy State, right? Where little elementary school teachers, kids, were being taught how to add and subtract only by drawing cows. You had to draw enough cows so that you could count the legs to get the right answer. And you had to draw the cows. And what's so maddening about this is how, if you're, how do you help a kid with this if you don't know? But that's my point. It took eight minutes to do one problem where the stacking math took under a minute. You are literally not allowed to do stacking math in Common Core. They will mark you wrong every time. You can't bring, and I would have a much more respect for Common Core math if you could do both. Uh, if you said, if they even said, okay, do it this way, but you can do it. No, 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 no. You have to do it their way. What's the point of this? You're telling me the only conceivable point of this, it seems to me, is to create a mathematics paradigm and math homework that only the schools can help them with, not moms and dads. To absence, one more way they drive a wedge, right? There's, what, what material benefit? And, and I, I want my kids to be able to tell me how they did math as well as do it. But in the final analysis, it doesn't matter if they can explain it to me. They have to do it. Go back to what our little community organizer said, right? Do you see that this is math meant for people like me? If you put me in a group, when I, in second, third grade, you put me in a group of two other math kids, I'm going to go with a smart kid every single time. I'm not going to argue with it. I'm going to agree. And if you allow me in math class to spend how many minutes every day drawing cubes and circles and squares and cows, fine with me. In other words, that's math for people like me, not for people who are good at math. And what, what do you think is going on in the minds of kids who can really do math? Do you see how utterly frustrating this is? Why kids are refusing to go to school? Why little kids, oftentimes the little boys who are, who are intrinsically good at this, are now sick, they want no part of math? Do you see how this is stultifying kids? But why are they doing it? They're sacrificing, because it's not fair. It wasn't fair that I could read at a college level in third grade. I was, wh wh why did I do to, deserve, do to deserve that? It wasn't fair. And it's not fair that some kids can get way ahead in math early and not me that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do communal math. We, our job is to make math at the lowest possible denominator, something that makes us all comfortable. Right? Everybody's happy with the math they know. But as Milgram points out, oh, by the way, do you know, in every high achieving, Milgram pointed this out, in every high achieving math country in the world, South Korea, Sweden, Taiwan, in every high achieving math country, kids start algebra in seventh or even sixth grade. In No Child Left Behind America, kids don't even start, American kids don't start algebra in seriously till eighth grade. Under Common Core, algebra is routinely pushed into high school. As Milgram said, and you understand why, right? If it takes eight minutes to do a problem, and that didn't even take into account however 10, 15 minutes they have to give the group to come up with the answer. You understand why they can't get to any higher math. And so uh, that's why algebra is pushed into ninth grade. But as Milgram points out, if your kids are w waiting to get algebra to high school, they will not have the opportunity to get calculus and higher math in high school anymore. How will they be prepared for higher math? They won't be. And Jason Zimba, the math guy who did the math standards, flat out said they won't be ready. How is this more rigorous? Now, I get it, right? Do you see how if you're a math-minded little girl, being forced to think about math that way is going to short-circuit you? You get that? But is that rigorous or is it just stupid? stupid. Now, again, it makes somebody like me feel good, but I'm not going to be good at math no matter what you do. It would be like if in my English class, they forced me to keep reading Beezus and Ramona. What would have been my, eventually, what would have been my attitude towards reading and writing? I wouldn't have entered the high finance world of English professor, right? <laughs> you get it. But so what? This is, and this, you think I'm making this stuff up. They're already doing it. 
There are 20 different, on the internet, you can find 20 different notes like this posted on school boards. This one is from Irvine Unified, the entire Irvine, California school district from kindergarten through high school. Apparently what happened in California is what's happening all over the country. Moms and dads got really fed up in California that their sons and daughters didn't know how to actually add in fourth and fifth grade. Fourth and fifth grade, they didn't know how to do it. And so they started hiring two math tutors for their kids. This really made California schools mad. This actually, you can go look at it right now. This appears on the Irvine Unified School District of Orange County, Cal for all the kids to read. It's a warning and a threat. Here's the warning. The links on this page are intended to support the classroom instruction that your child receives from his or her teacher. It is not appropriate to go ahead of the classroom or to use this site to have your child work on math that is intended for use in subsequent grades. There's your warning, don't, and then the threat. Your child's math instruction and placement will not change as a result of working ahead in these materials. And they have to underline what that means for you because maybe they thought you had Common Core English. <laughs> this means that your child will continue to work in the grade level appropriate math regardless of any work that is done from these materials or submitted to the teacher. In other words, it doesn't matter what kind of math your kids can do. They are going to stay put. They're going to do what everybody else does. They will get no credit. They will not be allowed to move ahead. Do you understand now why we're losing gifted and educated, talented programs? This is rank communism. I emphasize commune, right? The premise of this is it's much more important that everybody feel good about a little math than anybody put their head up and do really good at it. It is shocking. I think this is the, the most disgusting thing I've shown you so far. You'll, but you, never fear, you'll see worse. But up till now, this is the most disgusting thing I've shown you. You've got actual schools telling kids, right, to stay put, stand pat, don't lift your head up, don't look ahead, don't move forward. All over the country they're doing. They're getting mad at your kids, and they're getting mad at you because you want your kids to do better. Because it's all the standard based, it's all the testing, all that garbage, right? All right. Have another drink. Yes, I, that's a good point. I think I have another. <laughs> and this is the what comes with Common Core section. And I got to tell you, every time I give this talk, I can't believe I'm saying it. So this is the, you just please, can do go, I'll give you all this stuff at the end. You double check me. But there's no doubt debating any of this anymore. I've already mentioned to you the mandated cooperation with Obamacare. I'm not, I've got... That 27,000 page Obamacare document. You remember the one that Nancy Pelosi said, you gotta read it, pass it before you know what's in it? Well, now that we know what's in it, there are all sorts of, uh, you, the yellow's not, the yellow highlights aren't coming through. There are all sorts of places in Common Core, <coughs> in Obamacare, that mandate that the schools become data and informational gathering places for your kids, right? This is the whole data mining component. You can get all these slides at the website free. Look at them yourself. There's a lot of evidence. I mean, it's, it's, unbel it's undeniable what's going on. Do you know that we're now building schools? M much of our new school construction, many of our new schools that we're putting up, we're building from scratch, have clinics and pharmacies. <clears throat> we're building middle and high schools with pharmacies. Why? Because under Obamacare, the school can give your kid a board of fashion medicine. They can give your kid any kind of birth control. They can take your 13-year-old, 12-year-old daughter off campus and get her an abortion paid for by the federal government and never consult you now. But you knew that, right? That's not news. That's what they can do. But now you see why they're building new schools with pharmacies attached, right? Because why drive you off campus to the local CVS? Have it all right there, right? All the stuff they're going to give your kids. This. This is the building, that's the facility they just finished last year in Utah. That's where all the data on your kids is gonna be kept, right? That's the huge multi-billion dollar facility that all these data and this data and records gonna be kept in. You know, remember when we were kids? And you'd go to school, you'd have a bad day, a bad week, you'd, you'd fail a test, but the only thing that ever appeared on your transcript was your final grade. Under Common Core, every single grade, every teacher comment, every conduct evaluation, every quiz grade becomes part of your kid's permanent record for his entire life. And they have already said they plan to make them available to potential employers. So under Obamacare, your kids are kids until they're 27, right? 
So at 28, when your kid goes to get his first job, so you laughed. I've been to states, good for you, Pennsylvania, I've been to states where nobody got the joke, so thank you. You already passed your first Common Core test. But when your kid goes to get a job, they're going to be sifting through their second, third, and fifth grade records. You know, there's this program now in the public schools that's driving teachers nuts. It's, it predates Common Core, but it's gotten really serious with Common Core. <clears throat> it's a program whose initials are PBIS. It's an acronym. I, f I always forget what the acronym, I an acronym is. A anagram. An acronym. No, what is it called? Anacronym. Thank you. I mean, I'm an English teacher. I always forget the anacronym that PBIS stands for. But it's basically a behavior, mo a behavior monitoring program where every day in class, teachers have to spend time making behavioral and attitude assessments on your kids. They have to enter them into the computer every single day. In fact, teachers are griping all over the country about how it takes them more time to do these daily conduct evaluations on the kids. And all that becomes part of the permanent record, too. Right? It's where, the, where it's going to be housed. <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of questions now. The federal government is mandated to get answers from, from your kids in school. That's one of hundreds of pages. Let me show you this. This is the document. You look this up online. This is a, if it's not a federal curriculum, if it's not a national program, why in the world is the Department of Education, the Department of Health, the Department of the Schools, why are they writing all this parallel curriculum to Common Core? Now, technically, this is not a Common Core document because it's not a teaching document, but it's built primarily, excruciatingly for the Common Core program. Look at the title of the document. Promoting Grit, Tenacity, and Perseverance. <clears throat> Critical Factors for Success in the 21st Century. It's an education document, Department of Ed. It was written, as you can see, about a year ago in February 2013. Now, just look at the title. This is their attitude about your kid's education. Grit it out, suck it up, hang in there. Persevere. This is their attitude. And can you, I understand it. If your kids are going to be reading about insulating buildings, and right, this is, you see what they've transformed education. Education is no longer something that helps your kids blossom or bloom or become critical thinkers or define what they want to be or open horizons for them. When I think of the word, when I hear the word grit, I think of John Wayne getting a bullet dug out of his thigh, right, with a hot Bowie knife. This is, this, this is the attitude of this kind of, you know what this is? As, as has been said many times, this is school to work curriculum. This is, let's, let's build a generation, generations of compliant drones. And you know one of the great ironies about all this? If Bill Gates gets his way, there will never be another Bill Gates in this country. You think about the odd path that Bill Gates took, dropping out here, and, no way, no more, all right? And you know who supports Common Core, maddeningly? The Chambers of Commerce, which are, you know, people think the Chambers of Commerce are these right-wing conservative groups. Well, wait a second. Is the same chambers of commerce that support open borders and amnesty? Why? Because they want cheap, low-skilled labor. They don't want more CEOs. They don't want more vice presidents. They want assembly line worker bees, right? And this is going to be a way to guarantee it. These, you go to the first page of that document, you see these. These are the ways they're already intending to data mine your kids. And in some of those, school, those states that have had Common Core longer than you have, like New York, they're already doing it. This one on the right, the one, that's basically a blood pressure cuff that measures pulse and heart rate. That, and they've, they've boiled it down so they can put it on a little kid's wrist. How do we know this? Got a uh, fax from a mom in New York City, Manhattan. Her 13-year-old daughter came home with a very angry purple bruise on her wrist. And mom said, what happened? Well, they pulled this little girl into a room. They put that on her wrist. They had it too tight. They pulled, pulled her into a room. They asked her over 600 questions, including questions like, do your parents vote in the last, did you, do your parents vote? Did they vote in the last election? Who did they vote for in the last election? Are there guns in your house? Would you feel better if somebody from the school came and took those guns away? Are your parents divorced? This little girl's parents were. Would you feel better if the school helped you live with the parent you wanted to live with? All right. Hundreds and hundreds of such questions. This is another one, the facial expression, cam facial expression camera. Right? It's a camera that they, when your kids get laptops at school, you better be very careful. A lot of schools are moving, even some Pennsylvania school districts are moving to just laptop computers, no other school supplies for high school kids. When you get these computers from the schools, inevitably they have NASA quality global satellite positioning. They know where this is all the time. And many of them now are being equipped with facial expression cameras. When your kid opens his state laptop and turns it on, he is immediately being, everything he does on the computer is recorded. 
they record him. They're literally filming him. Now, I'm not suggesting that there's somebody sitting at the other end of that watching it. This is like the NSA spying business, right? Where they gather all your phone calls and dump them in a file. And if they ever need to investigate you for any reason, they can go back into that file and piece those conversations together, right? But think about the implications of this. Your eight-year-old daughter is doing her math homework on her computer in her nightgown or the computer's on and she happens to walk out of the bathroom after taking a shot. All this gets recorded. Anybody who walks in the range of that, that camera right, while the computer's on, that becomes part of the data prof profile. All of this gets dumped into your kid's file along with all those marks and grades and exam scores. And at any point, the government can go into that file and piece it together. Keystroke technology. Every single keystroke ever punched on that computer gets recorded. Right? This is how they're going to do it. And they want to biologically have posture analysis seats in classrooms. Do certain subjects or topics cause your kids to shrink down in the ch anxiously? The pressure mouse, right? Do certain themes or content or subject matter cause your kid to squeeze the mouse more tightly or cause their palms to sweat more? Do you know they're even working on right now an MRI for classroom use? They're boiling, they, they're creating an MRI, a brain scan that they can use in classrooms to monitor your kid's brain waves when they listen to and study and read in school. That's the brave new world. And <clears throat> this stuff, it, it, now, I guarantee you somewhere some of this is in your Pennsylvania schools. But I know it's in New York schools, and I know it's in Kentucky schools. And one of the reasons Florida, Florida, right? We talked about those three schools, right? I already told you what happened in New York. The freaking out going on. Right now, there are, there's, a, there's dozens of New York Democrat lawmakers crafting legislation to kill Common Core in New York. You've got the New York State State Teachers Unions calling for the head of the Secretary of Education who brought it to them. This is a big problem. Kentucky has put a moratorium on any new Common Core standards coming into the states after two years of horrible performance and is looking for a way out of math and English. Florida last summer, Test grades were so bad that the Florida managed, Governor Scott managed to pass a bill through the legislature that prohibits the federal government's two big testing agencies from testing the kids nationally on Common Core in the state of Florida. It means the state's still stuck with the standards, but the feds can't measure them. They can't test them. That's a big first step, right? And Florida did that much, right? So these are things that you can think about. But all three of the four, three of the state, the three states that got the early rollouts, they're all, it's all there already. They want to not, uh, my state, Wisconsin, Governor Walker's state, right? This, and Governor Walker has been rock solid on a lot of things. But just three weeks ago, the assembly, the Wisconsin assembly, set aside $7 million of taxpayer money to begin the process of data mining Wisconsin school kids. And when we asked the Republicans in particular why they voted for, and more Republicans and Democrats voted for it. And when we asked why, every one of them said because Governor Walker wants it. That's why. So yeah, there you go, right? This data mining, it's coming. It's big. And by the way, if your state took race to the top money, part of the, in the fine print of the race to the top application, once Common Core is implemented, the states that took the money are now obligated to turn over all the required data to the federal government, simply by taking the money, right? And then it gets, goes from bad to worse, not surprisingly. <clears throat> With a program like this, there are all sorts of special interest groups who have piggybacked onto Common Core. And I want to remind you that they were doing it before Common Core. So all, Common Core is going to make everything I show you now worse. But all, almost all of this stuff has origins prior to Common Core. Right? So among the other things are, are these. This is absolutely staggering. I want you to pay attention to this document. It was written in the fall of 2012. Right? right when Common Core was getting rolling. And look at the title of the document. These are the National Sexuality Education Standards. Now, based a little tutorial over what we've covered. The fact that they're national means what? Who's responsible? This curriculum, we don't take five-year-olds and put them in health class. We don't have for our six-year-olds biology class. So what in the world are they going to be teaching your kids at five and six? What, under the National Sexuality Standards, here's what has to happen. This set of curriculum standards is meant to be taught in every other subject matter. Every day in math, in English, in history, there's going to have to be some sex education going on. And when, I'll, I'll prove it to you. You turn to the very first page of this document and look at what it says. <clears throat> the National Sexuality Education Standards were further informed, they consulted mutually by Center for Disease Control. Look at the last two things there. 
the Common Core State Standards for English and Math. What in the world does Common Core English and Math have to do with the National Sexuality Standards? Why in the world would the people who put together the sexuality curriculum be specifically consulting those things? I'll tell you why because that's where they're going to teach it. Now, you remember that question I left hanging out there like a great big softball? Why are so many of the English books highly sexualized? Do you understand now? Do you now know why maybe Common Core has so much sexually inappropriate material in it? Because English, like math, like history, like science, they're all going to have to, in some small degree, begin to teach this stuff. It becomes folded into every other curriculum. And I, it just makes, it tickles me, boy. Every time I go to a state like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, you talk to people, you haven't had your test yet. Talk to people about this, show them this. Oh, this won't happen in our state. It's already happening. Look at the books your kids are reading. Look at the common core textbooks they're bringing home. The idea that you can vote this out, that you can keep everything else about common core but vote this out, you can't because this is designed to be a part of the curriculum. That's just staggering, right? that the national sexuality standards were further informed by the work of Common Core English and Math. Now I think you have a sense of why there's so much sex in those texts. Now I'm going to show you some of the standards themselves. What they do is they break them up into three-year cycles. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Test. Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Test. Break it up into three-year cycles. Five, six, and seven-year-olds. Do, does anybody in this room teach their five-year-old about sex? Now you think about this. You don't. And you, you, you're, you're scoffing at the idea, right? But they're gonna. So you have two options now. You either don't teach them about sex and let the school do it, or you try to unteach what the school's teaching, at which point they win too, because you're putting sex in the mind of five year olds. I mean, you have a third option, the one I would recommend get them out of public school! Yeah. Yeah, I know. But that's not gonna happen for most Americans. And it probably won't happen for most of you either if you got your kids in public school. But you see the pressure they're putting on you here. Like it or not, they're going to do it. And it is criminally obscene to start teaching kids that young about sex because they don't have the, the neocortex, parts of their brain that they need to develop. It hasn't, it, they, they don't have the ability to think abstractly or critically. You're starting to teach kids as young as five years. You're mainstreaming things like homosexuality for kids as young as five years old. Here are some of the standards. I took right from this document for five, six, and seven-year-olds. <clears throat> By the end of second grade, students should be able to identify different kinds of family structures and demonstrate ways to show respect for different kinds of families. So who gets to define what respect is? You're not going to teach your five, six, and seven-year-old about gay marriage. You're not going to teach them about Johnny has two daddies, but they're going to. So now the state's telling your kids that by the time they reach seven years old, they will find ways to show respect for different kinds of families. Do you think it's possible in the eyes of the state to show respect for gay marriage if your kid doesn't support it, or your family doesn't, or the biblical tradition or Jewish tradition or Muslim tradition out of which you come doesn't support it? And what does this have to do with sex ed anyway? I thought sex ed, and I don't believe it belongs in the schools at all, but I thought sex ed was all about keeping kids safe teaching them basic biology, you know, egg and sperm, and teaching them about condoms. As much as that doesn't belong in the schools, this is, this is the next step. That's pure sociology. That has nothing to do with the biology or the dangers of sex. For seven-year-olds, six-year-olds. How about the next one? Describe differences and similarities in how boys and girls may be expected to act. Now, that's interesting because if math isn't true, you know biology and gender aren't, right? How many of you know what Jer Governor Jerry Brown did in California a few months ago? He passed the first law of its kind in, in the state, in the United States, whereby any child in the public schools, age five or up, who shows up to school and decides he or she is the opposite gender, they must immediately be allowed into the opposite bathrooms. They cannot be prohibited from playing on the opposite sports teams and using the opposite gender's showers afterwards. Already a law in California, and there are all states across the union are starting to adopt these laws, right? I'll tell you what's going to happen. In the next 10, year, 10 years, you're going to be spending millions and millions of dollars, billions of dollars across the country to create third bathrooms and locker rooms and showers for kids who are gender questioning. But Jerry Brown, and a lot of liberal people were mad at him. A lot of liberals in California were upset, and they said to him, Governor Brown, 
why don't you just require every school in California to build a third set of showers, a third set of lockers, third set of bathrooms for kids who are gender confused? That's the politically correct term. And he said no, because that's separate but equal, and that's discrimination. As if this whole business, little boy, kids who haven't hit puberty yet deciding that would, how do you decide, how do you decide before you hit puberty what gender you are anyway? Why are we allowing kids as young as seven and nine to decide they want to be something else when their hormones haven't kicked in yet? But that's the law now. And notice how Governor Brown tries to link this garbage to the civil rights movement? Separate but equal, right? If a little boy says he's a little girl and we don't treat him like a little girl or make him go to his own little bathroom, we're discriminating against that little boy. And you know who was never consulted about any of this? All those little 13-year-old girls are not going to have to go to the bathroom with him. Right? That's the brave new world. You, again, I ask you, even if you think there is a place for sex ed in the schools, is that what this is? Since sex ed, sexual education. This is conditioning your kids to accept certain things. Again, describe differences and similarities in how boys and girls may be expected to act. Gender's all just a construct. There are no male, there is no female. And I, we would not, do you see this ridiculous next one? We would not ask this in college, it's so broad. Here's what they want your six-year-olds to do. <clears throat> Provide examples of how friends, family, media, society, and culture influence the ways that boys and girls think they should act. So you're gonna send your six-year-old to the internet to do a sex and gender search. Really? Because just how absurd that is for a six-year-old. But that's what they're going to do. How about for the next group? Kids from uh, eight, five, eight, nine, ten-year-olds, up until fifth grade, right? Eight, nine, and ten-year-olds. These are kids who have not yet gone through puberty but are on the cusp of it. They're being told by the government now how they will emotionally and socially react to it. Again, what does any of this have to do with sex ed? Explain the physical, I suppose you could argue that that might be the physics of biology of puberty, right? Voices cracking, hair growing. I don't think it belongs in the schools. But what about the next two? Explain the physical, social, and emotional changes that occur during puberty and childhood. Who gets to describe that? Pure sociology. You're going to tell kids how they should react emotionally to something that hasn't happened to them yet? How about the next one? Again, describe how friends, family, media, society, and culture can influence idea about body image, right? Why do you think you're a boy when there's no such thing as boys? Why are you convinced you're a girl when girls don't exist, right? And this, look at the last one. This is not an option. By the time you reach fifth grade, by the time you're 10, you will, this is the standard, you will define sexual orientation as the romantic attraction of an individual to someone of the same gender or someone of a different gender. Now look. This is America. You teach your kids whatever you want about sex. Your job is to do that. But this is not that. This is the school preempting you, right? What again if you come from a believing Christian home or, a, or an Orthodox Jewish home? Or a, what if, what if? Your word now is superseded by this word. You're not going to be teaching your kids this stuff that young anyway, but they're going to be doing it. And who's going to win, the state or you now? If this is the standard that is going to be measured and has to be tested to, how do you opt your kids out of it? The only, and this is, this is what's so insidious about this. You want to opt your kid out of the sex ed components of Common Core? Then you're going to have to opt them out of school altogether because it's going to be everywhere, every time in the curriculum. All sorts of things going on. Uh, any of you ever heard of a group called GLSEN? It's a gay and lesbian activist group. They've written a parallel curriculum to Common Core that the feds have already adopted. It says this that every day in every single subject area, there must be some gay positive language. Now, that doesn't mean all, but in math class, in gym class, in chemistry class, every day some of the examples have to show gay people in a positive light. So in math, you know, right, you got third grade math, you talk about Johnny's mom's got three apples and Johnny's dad's got two oranges, how much fruit does the family have? At least, what, not always. But at least once or twice a day, there has to be a gay positive example. Johnny's lesbian moms have so much, right? Every, and every single class, not just in, well, not just in biology, not just in sex ed, in every class, the curriculum has to conform to this. This is, what business is any of this of the federal government? But that's what they're doing, right? How about, oh, even that efficient time must be allocated for students to practice skills 
related to sexuality education and students need multiple opportunities and a variety of assessment strategies to determine their achievement of the sexuality standards and performance. In other words, parent share, is, it's not just going to be for math kids, right? Parent share sexuality standards. These, you, this is direct quotes from the document, right? Now, lest you think this will never happen in Pennsylvania or our schools won't accept that. My superintendent said we'd never have this. It's already there. The poster, I'm going to warn you, this is graphic. The poster I'm about to show you hangs in a sixth grade middle school classroom in Shawnee, Kansas. Shawnee, Kansas is not Philadelphia, and it's not Berkeley. It's not even crazy Madison, Wisconsin. Shawnee, Kansas is the middle of the Bible Belt. This poster has hung all year in that sixth grade classroom. Little sixth grade girl took a picture, took it home to her dad. That's how this became national news. About, um, about three weeks ago, this happened. It's been there all summer, all, all semester. This is the poster. Notice the title of the poster. How do people express their sexual feelings? Now, this hangs right next to Clifford the Big Red Dog. It's there all year round. It never comes down. And the title of it is, well, how do people express their sexual feelings? Notice that they've got talking on there twice. Talking is sexual. Hugging is sexual. Dancing is sexual. Saying I like you is sex. Along, they, they don't even worry about spelling. You ever been careased? Careasing. <laughs> If there's ever a metaphor for the backward ide ideology of Common Core, it's this. They can care less about duplicating things, making mistakes. They care less about things like spelling. But look at the other things on that list. Anal sex, touching each other's genitals, grinding, masturbation. And do you notice, this is what bothers me the most. For a public school system obsessed to the point of fetishization with birth control, do you notice how there's not the slightest suggestion in this poster that some of these things are dangerous? Some of them might, be, might lead to pregnancy. Some of them might lead to disease. You can't get a disease talking to somebody. And do you see the lengths they've gone to here? The whole premise of this exercise is to get your kids to believe that there is no moral or ethical difference between any of these things. That if you object to any one of them, you're objecting to all of them that they are all categorically the same thing and categorically acceptable. Do you see what they're mainstreaming here? What does this have to do with sex education? Sixth graders, 11-year-olds. And so what happened? I, I, gotta, I wanna emphasize that again. All the big social, go back to Bill Ayers. And you know, when uh, the unrepentant World Trade Center, uh, the Pentagon bomber Bill Ayers, the only career open to him after he got out of the terrorism business was education. He became a professor of education, where he spent 30 years in Chicago as an education teacher teaching young teachers that, quote, the place for communism is in our elementary schools, unquote. That's a direct quote from him. Now he's making $40,000 a year retired, going and talking at all the big universities about how we have to radicalize kids towards socialism at five and seven and nine years old. That's what he's doing. Go back before him to Saul Alinsky. And Alinsky said, Taking, make, forcing kids to separate morality and sex is the single best way to make them Marxists. This goes back to Karl Marx, right? Why are they doing this? What does this have to do with government control? The single biggest enemy to this kind of big government statism is Christianity, Judeo-Christianity. The single biggest thing you have to get rid of is any sense that distinguishes between right and wrong or good or bad. This kind of moral libertinism is a pounding ground that soften your kids up for all sorts of moral relativity. And again, I, I emphasize this. There's no, nothing that distinguishes any of those things. They're all the same thing. And you can't object to any one of them without being called a bigot. Sixth graders. And so dad predictably freaked out. And so here's the response dad got from the school. This is even worse than the poster. Here's the response dad got from the school. <clears throat> the poster that you reference is actually part of our middle school health and science materials. And so it is a part of our district approved curriculum. Where'd they get it from? The National Sexuality Standards. The curriculum it is a part of aligns with the national standards around these topics. And as such, it's part of our curriculum, and it stays. 
and it's there today. This is Hawker Grove Middle School spokeswoman Leanne Neal in Shawnee, Texas. It's all part of the national standard. Right? It's already in the schools, and it's already, and, and in a thousand different ways that maybe you don't notice. That, I mean, this is an obvious example, right? In a thousand different ways in the stories your kid's reading and the discussions they're having in class and the writing assignments they're being asked to do in class and the mainstreaming of all sorts of things they're doing in the public schools, it's, your kids are already getting this and they're going to get a lot, lot worse. And you wait till those tests kick in, right? All right, we go from bad to worse. Other groups that are involved in this, not surprisingly, Planned Parenthood. The book I'm about to show you predates Common Core. But in the last two years, new volumes, new versions of this book are all stamped Common Core compliant, right? And this is in most estimated most, like 60 to 70 percent of middle school, li school libraries in this country have this book. Right? And Planned Parenthood is trying to push it as a standard text for Common Core, one of the exemplars. The title of the book is, It's Perfectly Normal. It's a book whose premise is to teach masturbation to kids in fourth grade and younger. And when you open the book, the first thing you see is this, naked people. Again, just, it's the poster, right? The, the point of this is, is that you see how egalitarian it is? Fat naked people, skinny naked people, black naked people, white naked people, Hispanic naked people, handicapped naked people, even little baby naked people. In other words, there's nothing to be, this is normal, this is natural, and then they go on to graphically show kids pictures of how they should masturbate, to teach them with graphic illustrations how to do it. Right? So this raises an issue. A big issue. It's already in the schools. Now, when you talk to people about this, they're going to say, well, and technically they're right. Technically, the national sexuality standards do not advertise themselves exclusively as Common Core. But I showed you in the first page where Common Core is ex English and math, is ex that's all they had so far. That's what they referenced. So they'll tell you this will never come to your school. They'll tell you it's not Common Core you're making this up. It's all Common Core. And if you get rid of Common Core tomorrow, you're still going to have to find a way to get rid of these because they'll just linger that on. But this is where the schools are. Common Core is, the mecha, is a big, is a much broader swath now, a much broader opening for them to jam all this stuff in. And even if you close it down, you're still going to have the stuff. And you see all the ways that it's linking itself up with Common Core. We have a document, over 200 clinical developmental child psychologists, social workers, who have work with developmental and kids developing. And they are furious. They, they've signed a petition calling for the immediate ban of Common Core because it is doing serious damage to the development of young kids, forcing them to deal with issues like this at those ages. It's, it, it, they can't process it. Their little minds haven't developed to that point yet. I'm going to show you a short clip from one of those doctors. This is Dr. Mary Calamia. She's a clinical social worker in New York, one state over, right? And she testified before the New York State Senate about this. One of the reasons why New York is now trying to get out of this. And she speaks for the 200 on that list. If you want to go to that website I'll show you at the end, we brought Dr. Gary Thompson to Wisconsin. Anybody heard of him? Dr. Gary Thompson is a Utah child psychologist. He's got two children. One is special needs, and the other is developmentally uh, accelerated. She's really smart. And so both his kids have been completely cut off by Common Core. He came to Wisconsin. He's been in all sorts. He, Glenn Beck interviewed him for an hour on one of his programs. He's been all across the country talking about this, become an activist. You can see, if you go to that website, you can see Gary Thompson's testimony. He absolutely devastates them. All right? This is bad for kids. To, and these, are, these people are Democrats. They're Republicans. They're Libertarians. I want to show you Dr. Mary. Right? This is one of the things that helped begin to turn this around in New York. This is her experience with Common Core. Good afternoon. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm a psychotherapist. Um, I work with parents, children, and uh, about half of my caseload is teachers also. I re uh, my caseload represents about 20 different school districts in Suffolk County. In the fall of 2012, my phone started ringing. I started getting an inordinate number of referrals of students, uh, a lot of honor students, eighth graders mostly, who were self-mutilating. They were cutting themselves with sharp objects, and they were burning themselves with cigarettes. My phone never stopped. And I didn't know why. I asked the kids, and all they kept saying was, 
we can't take the pressure, it's too much. I also started getting a lot of elementary school students referred to me. They were refusing to go to school. They said they were, felt stupid and that school was too hard. They were throwing tantrums, begging to stay home, and upset to the point of vomiting. I was hearing from parents about kids bringing home homework they couldn't help them with. They, I was alarmed to hear that in some cases there were no textbooks for the parents to look at and they had no idea what their children were learning. The teachers were reporting a staggering level of anxiety and depression and that was when I first heard the term common core and learned about the standards that we now say set the bar so high anyone can walk right under it. Everyone was talking about the tests, the tests. As the school year progressed and the tests loomed, my patients were increasing their self-mutilating behaviors. They were complaining of insomnia, panic attacks, loss of appetite, depressed mood, and in one case, suicidal thoughts that resulted in a two-week hospital stay for an adolescent. I don't know of any formal studies that connect these symptoms to the Common Core, but I really don't think we need to sacrifice an entire generation of children just to get the correlation. The Common Core and high-stakes testing is creating a hostile working environment for teachers and consequently a hostile learning environment for students. When I first heard about the Common Core, APPR, and high-stakes testing, my first thought was, who is going to rate the parents? I see children and teenagers who are exhausted, running from activity to activity, living on fast food, then texting, using social media, and playing games well into the wee hours of the morning on school nights. We have children taking cell phones into the classrooms, tweeting and texting each other all day. We have parents, and yes, parents, who are texting their children during the school day. Let's add in bullying and cyberbullying that torments our children, uh, even to the point of suicide, and the interminable drug problem that we have. And these variables affect student performance, and we make the teachers responsible for their performance. The SED holds them accountable, substituting innovation and individualism with cookie-cutter standards, believing that's going to fix our schools. We can't regulate biology. Young children cannot engage in the type of critical thinking that the Common Core calls for. That would require a fully developed prefrontal cortex, a part of the brain that is not fully functional until adulthood. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for critical thinking, rational decision making, and abstract thought, all things that the Common Core requires prematurely. We give children pre-assessments, tell them to succeed, and then give them tests on material they haven't learned and tell them it's okay to fail. They cannot resolve that mixed message. Last spring, a six-year-old encountered a multiplication sign on the NWEA first grade math exam and asked the teacher what it was. The teacher was not allowed to help him and told him to just do his best. From that point on, the student's test performance went downhill. He couldn't shake off the unfamiliar symbol and couldn't believe his teacher wouldn't help him. The Common Core requires children to read informational texts that are owned by a handful of corporations. They don't have a filter to distinguish good information from bad. So whatever you put in front of them, they take that as gospel. They're literal. So when we give them a textbook that explains the Second Amendment as, the people have the right to keep and bear arms in a state militia, they will look no further for clarification. We ask them to write critically using emotionally charged language to persuade instead of inform. They don't have that functional prefrontal cortex. So they tap into their limbic system, which is the part of the brain that involves basic human emotions, anger and fear being the foremost. So when we ask them to use emotionally charged language, we're actually asking them to fuel their language with fear and anger and aggression. They cannot temper this judgment. They don't have the, the, the ability to do that. So we teach to the test, which I think doesn't really measure learning. I think the tests measure endurance and resilience. Only a child who can sit still for 90 minutes, come back the next day and do it again, and the next day again can succeed. I'm going to introduce you to a, a couple, I'm almost done, I'm going to introduce you to just a couple of, of student stories, okay? A couple of the faces of the Common Core. We have an entire third grade class that spent the entire day sobbing after one testing session. A second grader who witnessed this is now in third grade and won't go to school. 
She's being evaluated, a seven-year-old being evaluated for psychotropic medication just to get her to go to school. A six-year-old who came home crying because in September, in, in the first grade, she didn't know what a vertex was. Two eight-year-olds opted out of the ELA exam and were publicly denied cookies because the teacher gave them to the class but wouldn't give them to them. And that teacher, who under duress, felt obligated to do such a thing. A sixth grader who once aspired to be a writer but now won't do it because we do it all day long, even in math. And a mother who has to leave work early because her son is hysterical over his math homework and his CPA grandfather who's babysitting for him can't even help him do it. And countless other kids who are refusing to go to school feel stupid and now are completely turned off to education. I will conclude with this one thought. Our country became a superpower on the backs of men and women who learned in one, one room schoolhouses. This isn't rocket science. It doesn't take a great deal of technology or corporate or government involvement to, to help our children to succeed. We need to rethink the Common Core and the associated high stakes testing and get back to the business of educating our children in a safe, healthy, and productive manner. Thank you. Thank you. By way of wrapping up then, um, oh, real quickly, that's Michael Barber. Uh, this came up briefly earlier. He is the CEO of Pearson Publishing, right? Pearson Publishing right now <clears throat> owns 100% of the Canadian textbook market. He owns 80% of the American textbook market. Over the last six months, he's been buying up small American presses and paying four and five times what they're worth because he wants to be the only textbook provider here. He is an ally of Bill Gates. He has donated huge amounts of money to Common Core, and he stands to be the only textbook company standing. When, and when that happens, there will be no non-Common Core textbooks. He's already said that. Both Barber and Gates have approached the UN, about the United Nations, about making this not just an American curriculum, but a global curriculum. That's the end game. How many of you, they've approached UNESCO. How many of you know UNESCO, the United Nations Education Fund? How many of you, who can tell me what the motto of UNESCO is? Your kids are our kids. Yeah. And that's the objective here. All right? That's Michael, that's Michael Barber. All right. Um, that's the, that right there is the website. If you want this information, uh, go to that website. You can get it for free. If there's anything you can't find, email me or email us. We'll make sure you get it. As I wind down, I have a couple of comments. Inevitably, when I end this, it's depressing, but people always say, well, what, is, what can we do? So I'm going to take a minute and tell you that. The first thing I want to say to you is that, and I'd ask you to, can we please have a round of applause for the hosts here who brought us here and let us use this? <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about them in the JBS. They've been looking out for this kind of stuff for 50 years. This is precisely the kind of things that for 50 years, the men at those tables have been helping America to understand. One thing you can do if you are serious now about this is talk to them. They have all sorts of networks. They've been doing this for years. They can help organize to fight this back. Consider joining with them on this. Or find other groups. This is a good one. This is the best one out there. But get involved. Because here's what's going to happen. They're waiting you out. This has already got a two-year head start. Now you know about it. They're going to wait you out. Here's what you can do to fi forget the federal government. It's a lost cause. If you want to fix this, get on the case of your state and local congressmen and senators. Get on the people in your state who represent you. Do I believe politics is the fix for this? No, I do not. But hold the people who you vote for to represent you locally. You've got to get on their case. They've got to hear from you. You've got to let them know how unhappy you are and keep after them. That's the first thing. What's going to happen in Pennsylvania next year sometime, after your kids take that first test, there are going to be a lot of moms and dads who are suddenly wide awake. You have got to keep the pressure on until then, and then push harder. The only way you're going to win this is if moms, enough moms and dads get mad. The politicians will have to be dragged, because there's so much money being thrown at the states by the federal government to simply blindly take this, that your politicians won't do it unless you make them. But I'm telling you, and I'll give you an example. We, we, down in Wisconsin, I was walking through the state house in Madison, and I get this, pssst, I'm like a drug deal or something, right? There in one of the dark recesses, it was something out of a film noir. 
out of the dark recesses of the state house. I walked over there, and a, a, a guy ushers me into the darkness. It's a Democratic state senator from Madison, Wisconsin. And he says to me, Dr. Pesta, he's a Democrat who's opposed to Common Core, but he's afraid to say so publicly. He pulled me aside and he said to me, you got to do me one favor. When you talk to your moms and dads, tell them this for me. I've been a state senator for 20 years. I tell my staff, I tell my aides, if you get 10 phone calls on any issue, it's a big deal. I can count on one hand the number of times in the last 20 years I've gotten 10 phone calls about anything. When we hear, when we local politicians here, if we get hundreds of calls, it freaks us out. If we get thousands of calls, we're sweating bullets. Right now, the state house in Madison is being nothing, there are tens of thousands of calls are piling into these people. And it's forced, they know they can't drop it. They're getting really upset about it. Politics, you have to drag them. But the way you do it, I, I've given, I think, what, 139 talks on Common Core now. And in those 139 talks, I've talked to maybe 30,000 people. Statistically insignificant. But 30,000 phone calls to a state legislature is huge. What you have to do, if you are serious about trying to fight this, and I look around the room today, and this is almost always the case, 70% of the people who show up at these talks are grandmas and grandpas, not moms and dads. The vast majority of moms and dads, they're working two jobs, they're not paying any attention. Here's what I'm telling you. It doesn't take that many people. But the first and foremost thing you have to do is get other people to listen to talks like this, to get other people to pay attention. If, if everybody in here just grabbed one person and got them to see it, this would start to take off. And you're going to be helped next year when the tests kick in. So be ready for that. If, if you, enough moms and dads get mad, I'm promising you, you'll make them act on it. Look what's happening in New York. New York is... is irredeemably out there in political la-la land, but the moms and dads in New York, and New York, you know, I gave a talk about eight months, uh, six months ago in October. I was in Albany, New York. I spoke to 1,000 moms and dads in a single room about this because they had already, why were there 1,000 of them there and there's only 50 of you here? Because they had had their first test then, right? That wakes people up. So we're still America to the degree that if enough of you pitch a fit, you'll get your way but you're going to have to drag the politicians. And you start by let, putting them on notice that you want them to stop it. Call your guy or your woman and say to them, look, I voted for you last time. I'm not doing it again unless you come out against Common Core. Take that initiative and keep on them. And then the more people you get to hear and see it, the more chance you're going to have. They're waiting on you. They're, they're fully expecting you to get mad, leave here, and then tomorrow forget about it. If you do that, it's a done deal. You're not going to get out of this. But keep in mind that 24 of the 46 states that took it in that weird way, are now trying to get out of part or all of it. There's no reason Pennsylvania shouldn't be one of those states. You're not right now. You should be. <clears throat> and you're going to have, and a lot of this stuff, you're going to get lied to, right? That's why you should do your own homework. People, I'll, I, I've gone all over the country. I'll keep doing it. And there are other people here who can help you. But that's the only advice I have for you. Get with your politicians in the state and let them know how you feel and then try to, if you've got a granddaughter, you've got a niece, a, a niece whose mom isn't paying attention, try to wake them up. They're going to see it soon enough when the, the same thing's going to happen in Pennsylvania that happened in New York and Kentucky and Florida. It's not going to be good. But you're going to have to build on that momentum and keep pushing forward.